It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anna Golub and Dr. Marianne Overland to speak at Medicine Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Golub is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine, an associate medical director for the Center for Excellence in Primary Care Education at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System. Uh, Dr. Golub is a University of Washington lifer, uh, completing her, uh, earning her undergraduate and medical school degrees, as well as completing her house staff training and chief medical residency all here at UW. Her clinical practice is based at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System, where she specializes in outpatient primary care and women's health. Her academic interests are in physician trainee wellness and ambulatory internal medicine graduate medical education. Dr. Marianne Overland is also an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine and serves as Associate Program Director for Primary Care in the UW Internal Medicine Residency Program. She's also previously served as President of the Northwest Regional Chapter for the Society of General Internal Medicine. Dr. Overland obtained her medical degree from the University of Rochester and completed her house staff training and chief medical residency here at the University of Washington. Dr. Overland's, clin Overland's clinical practice is also based at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System, where she specializes in outpatient primary care and women's health. Her academic interests are in medical education, focusing on improving ambulatory training for internal medicine residents. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Golub and Dr. Overland as they present updates in primary care. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Murphy and Dr. Bremner. We're very pleased to be here today and excited to share what we've learned in the, in the last year's uh, literature about primary care, which is something that's near and dear to both of our hearts and what we do every day. We also just want to say for those of you who are wistful to not be at the National SGIM meeting this week, we hear you. Uh, hopefully we'll give you a flavor of some of the updates you might have heard there. And anyone who's planning to travel to the National ACP meeting next week in New Orleans, um, you're getting a sneak preview today because we're giving a larger version of this talk at the ACP National Meeting, and so we'd love to bump into you there as a, a familiar, friendly face. I have no disclosures, <laughs> for better, for worse. <laughs> All right, so we are going to be covering 11 articles and one guideline published in the last year that are relevant um, to our practice in primary care medicine. Uh, we chose articles that we thought would be both interesting and potentially impactful. We're going to be presenting these using a case-based format. Hopefully these cases will ring true to your primary care experience or be familiar to you. Um, and without further ado, let's get started. As true generalists, we're going to be covering a broad variety of topics today, similar to what you'd see in a primary care clinic day. Okay, let's jump into the first case. This is Miss Maya Algia. She's a 67-year-old woman, history of hypertension, prior tobacco use, and coronary disease that's stable. She's coming into established care today. She's currently taking a baby aspirin, lisinopril, and metoprolol. You're, you're doing a very good job. Uh, and note that she is not taking a statin. And advise her, this is actually strongly recommended given her history of coronary disease. And she assures you, oh yes, oh yes, doctor, I definitely tried the statin, but it made me feel terrible. I hurt all over. I could not tolerate it. I just can't do it. All right, so I want uh, a show of hands who really uh, wants this patient back on a statin, if at all possible. Everybody. Who thinks they can make a compelling case to her to try it again? Okay. We're willing to give it a try, but we're not so sure that we can be compelling. So I'm hoping after we review the next article, uh, you may be more armed and dangerous when you have this conversation to try to convince her to retry the statin. Okay, so this article was published in May of 2017 in The Lancet. Um, it's a really neat uh, trial in which these authors look back at some data from one of the primary prevention statin trials in the early 2000s, which you may remember the ASCOT trial. This was done um, and included patients in the UK, Scandinavia, and Scandinavia who were, um, uh, they were actually checking to see what the cardiovascular effects of statin would be, but they took advantage of a neat extension of a non-blinded extension of the statin trial to see how patients would tolerate their statin when they knew they were taking it. And the background here is that what we know from randomized controlled trials is that patients actually tolerate statins exceedingly well when they don't know that's what they're taking. So when they're blinded, there's no excess adverse events, events compared to placebo. However, what we know from observational data and in our real world experience, patients tolerate statins miserably, or many of them do. So about one in five experience muscle-related adverse effects and stop their statin because of this. And this is 
But pretty frustrating because these patients would clearly benefit um, in terms of cardiovascular outcomes if they were able to take their statins. So that's the background. So the clinical question for this trial was, uh, do statin-related adverse effects occur with the same frequency when patients and their providers do or don't know that that's what they're taking? Um, so as you recall, the initial trial, the ASCOT trial, was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. And then they're taking advantage of a non-randomized, non-blinded extension phase. The population included about 10,000 adults who had hypertension and at least three other cardiovascular risk factors. Phase one was a randomized blinded phase. Patients were randomized to get atorvastatin 10 milligrams a day or placebo. I'll also mention here that they did not have a run-in phase to make sure that these patients would tolerate statin. They were mostly statin naive at the start of the trial, and they threw them in if they were randomized to get that medication. The trial was ended early after 3.3 years because of clear cardiovascular benefits of atorvastatin. Then phase two was a uh, while they were looking at another arm of the trial, which is the hypertension arm, which I won't be addressing today, they invited the same participants who were on statin or not on placebo, they invited them to take statin open labels. So they knew what they were taking, a torvastatin 10 milligrams a day or no medication. And about two thirds of the participants or about 6,000 patients did elect to take statin and about 3,000 did not. So what were their outcomes of interest? They were looking at adverse effects in four categories, including muscle-related adverse effects, erectile dysfunction, sleep disturbance, and cognitive impairment. Um, I'll also say here that the way they uh, recorded these adverse effects was the same in both the blinded and unblinded phases of the trial. So the observers were blinded to the treatment allocation, and they were very systematic in the way they recorded adverse effects. OK, what did they find? So I am highlighting here the muscle-related adverse effect outcome because I think that's the one that we see in clinical practice is most commonly affecting our patients. What you can see here is that in blue is the blinded phase of the trial. Comparing placebo to atorvastatin, there's essentially little difference in the number of muscle-related adverse effects. In fact, these occur at a very similar rate of about 2% per year, and there's no statistically significant difference. So they are doing great. They're tolerating statins well without any excess muscle problems compared to placebo. However, then when you look at the non-blighted extension phase, comparing non-users of atorvastatin to, to users of atorvastatin, suddenly see this excess of adverse events correlating with a hazard ratio of 1.41, which did meet high statistical <laughs> significance. And these were the same patients who were taking the statin before and tolerated them. In fact, they're even the patients who elected to take statin, so maybe would even have a sort of a volunteer bias towards doing better at tolerating the statin. So what do we take home from this? They're able to show that similar to essentially all the other randomized control trials, patients do great on statins when they have no idea that's what they're taking. Um, but when we tell them or when they read about this medicine that they're taking, when we counsel them about it, all of a sudden they're subject to what's called the nocebo effect. And this term was coined in the 1960s as basically representing the opposite of the placebo effect, in which when patients are told or believe they'll have an adverse side effect, they're more likely to have it. They're going to have a sort of an ascertainment bias in terms of general symptoms they're having that are not specifically causally related to the medication. They're going to attribute it to that new medication. So the take home point for me here is that going forward, I'm going to be much more careful to counsel my patients just how well they're going to tolerate their statin, how very unlikely it is that they'll have a muscle-related adverse effect. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Overland. All right, thank you, Dr. Golub. Um, we're going to dive right into our next patient of the day because it's a busy day in primary care. And uh, what would a primary care day be without some hypertension? So Susan Print um, is a well-appearing, highly functional 72-year-old woman. She's got a little bit of chronic kidney disease, hypertension, osteoporosis. She's taking lisinopril. Alendronate, and she does not like taking her medication. She feels fine, and every time she comes in, you sort of have a joking conversation about why she needs to take any medications at all. Uh, but she kind of reluctantly goes home and continues to take her medication. So she's, uh, her blood pressures in clinic are pretty much usually in the 140s over 80s. Um, home blood pressure, she reports to you kind of from memory, 130s over 70s to 80s. Um, so what do you recommend to, to Ms. Brint uh, regarding her hypertension management? 
I want you to um, just to yourself kind of pick an answer here. Um, goal is 150 over 90, stop the lisinopril. You're sort of in the American Association of Family Physicians camp. Uh, goal is less than 140 over 90, continue the lisinopril. Less than 140 over 90, increase, or less than 130 over 80, and increase. So think to yourself. I'm not going to make you raise your hands because I'm always embarrassed to do that in public. Uh, but, you know, put your money where your brain is. Um, so why do we care about blood pressure? I'm preaching to the converted here. But as we all know, for every uh, 20 points of uh, blood pressure above 115 over 75, you're going to double your stroke risk, double your cardiovascular mortality risk. So at a blood pressure of 135 over 85, you have a double, uh, double your risk of stroke and a mortality over somebody whose blood pressure is 115 over 75. And that's been sort of shown over and over and over again. Um, in this meta-analysis that was actually published in 2016, they looked at over 600,000 people uh, in 123 blood pressure treatment trials, including SPRINT, uh, going back from the 60s and leading up till about 2015, early 2016, just to kind of show whether or not there is uh, a, a, how, how low can you go for the treatment effect. And basically showing that Per 10 millimeters of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure, you're going to have a 20% uh, reduction in major cardiovascular effects, 17% in coronary artery disease, and it's even better for all-cause mortality and stroke. Um, and there was a similar relative risk reduction at all baseline systolic blood pressures with and without risk factors, so going down to less than 130. Um, so... But as we all know, that we don't all agree about what the right target for blood pressure is. So um, if you want to like have some high drama in your life, just read all the recent editorials about blood pressure since the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association have come out with their new guidelines um, because it's pretty dramatic about how um, snarky people can be about blood pressure. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of disagreement about what is the right level. The American College of Physicians say for a healthy older adult, less than 150. The Europeans say less than 140. The Canadians say less than 160. Apparently, Molson's and maple syrup is protective. Um, but there's a lot of disagreement among really smart, thoughtful people about what are we actually supposed to be doing with our patients. So I think what we know is that we're just going to need another guideline. So in the late, uh, in the fall of 2017, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association came out with their new guideline. And this was a break off from JNC7. So um, the National Institutes of Health used to have their guideline originating uh, groups. Uh, JNC7 was the most recent uh, blood pressure guideline and they were working on JNC8 and then midway through that process and NIH said we want to get out of the guideline business. Um, so the artists formerly known as JNC8 decided to continue with their work because they had gone really far into the process and, and they published their new guidelines in 2015 which was saying healthy older adults could have a blood pressure of less than 150 over 90. Um, people with risk factors should be less than 140. But then at the same time in 2015, the American College of Cardiology said, we don't like that, we're going to do our own guidelines. And they commissioned that as sort of in response as the, the null vote against the, J, the artist formerly known as JNC8. So what do we know? This new guideline was extensive. I'm sure you've all read it uh, cover to cover. There's like 600 points and 1,000 references. Um, but they basically redefined blood pressure as we know it. So normal blood pressure is still less than 120 over 80 is where we would all love to be. Um, elevated blood pressure is this new category, like 120 to 129. Stage 1 hypertension actually starts at 130 now. And then stage 2 hypertension is greater than 140 over 90. And the controversy here. Um, among other things, is that they recommend for people with stage 1 hypertension, you put them through the ASCVD risk calculator. So what we're using right now to decide whether or not someone should be on a statin, we should put our hypertensive patients through that calculator as well and see whether they need hypertension uh, pharmacotherapy. Uh, the thing is that that ASCVD risk calculator wasn't validated for that purpose. So, you know, whether or not we should be using that as a guideline is, is up for some debate. But everybody with an elevated blood pressure should get lifestyle changes. Anybody in that 130 to 139 over 80 to 89 should get plugged into an ASCVD risk calculator if their risk is higher than 10%, that in addition to lifestyle changes, they should also get pharmacotherapy. 
And then anyone with one, over 140 over 90 should get lifestyle therapy plus medications. Um, this now increases the prevalence of hypertension in Americans to 46%, but only increases the number of people getting medications by a couple of percent. So it's very dramatic to say we're now saying half of all Americans are getting hypertension, but you know it's like one to two percent more people would be getting medication with these guidelines. Um, and also of note, the ASCVD risk of greater than 10% includes everybody who's over 75, anybody with diabetes, and most people with chronic kidney disease. But wait, there's more. So uh, late, late breaking news, 2018 uh, article from Brunstrom et al. in JAMA Internal Medicine was looking at the association of blood pressure lowering with mortality and cardiovascular disease across blood pressure levels to see what is the right, where's the money spot in terms of starting to think about blood pressure treatment. So they wanted to know, do mortality and cardiovascular event lowering effects of blood pressure treatment vary by baseline blood pressure? They did a systematic review, meta-analysis of 74 randomized controlled trials, 306,000 people, 1.2 million person years, looking at all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, major cardiovascular events. And they actually did find that there is a money spot. So start, if people have a baseline blood pressure of less than 140, so if you're in that 130s camp that now would get put into an ASCVD risk calculator based on the new guidelines, they said there's actually no mortality benefit, no cardiovascular disease mortality benefit, and no d difference in major cardiovascular events. So it's the people whose baseline blood pressure is higher than 140 who are going to benefit from pharmacotherapy for blood pressure. So what are you going to tell Ms. Brint? Oh my gosh, are we ever going to know the answer to this question? I don't know. Uh, my goal for her is to aim for probably less than 130 over 80 because she does have chronic kidney disease um, and she is very healthy. I imagine she's going to live to be 90 or 100 years old going how she's going right now. So she actually probably does have um, reason to push her a little bit lower, but I think it would be a very reasonable person in the room could also argue that less than 140 over 90 is a good goal for Ms. Prince. So, ACC and AHA redefined hypertension in late 2017. So, if you have a blood pressure of higher than 130, you are now hypertensive. Um, your, the new definitions classify half of Americans almost as hypertensive, but again, doesn't really increase the number of people who would be getting meds that much. Uh, so, we can consider a goal blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 to reduce cardiovascular mortality. But other professional societies, including a lot of very reasonable people, do recommend slightly higher blood pressure targets. Okay, let's talk about knee pain. This is how we roll in primary care. <laughs> so this is Miss Hermione Hurt. She's coming in, 59-year-old woman coming in. Um, she has a history of right knee osteoarthritis. She's having an acute flare of her pain. Um, She's having pain with weight bearing, her knee is swollen, she didn't injure her knee. On exam, you find that she does have a moderately warm knee, there is an effusion, but it's not red. Looking back in her chart, she's had four corticosteroid injections over the past two years. The last one was about four months ago. And she's asking you for another injection today. And the question is, what are you gonna do? All right, th thumbs up, inject that knee. Thumbs down, do not inject that knee or depends on how late I'm running in my clinic schedule that day. <laughs> Live in the real world. All right, so let's, let's look at an article published. All right, get, I get some variation here. Let's look at the, an article published in the last year that might help us inform this decision. So this is an article uh, published also in May of 2017 in JAMA, looking at the effect of intraarticular triamcinol injection into knees compared to saline and what its effect would be on cartilage as well as pain and function. This was performed by Dr. McAllendon and colleagues out of Tufts Medical Center. And the background question here is that it's actually uncertain what the effect of repeated corticosteroid injections on cartilage actually is. On the one hand, we know that in knee osteoarthritis, there's inflammation and over time inflammation does cause damage to the cartilage and furthers the disease progression. And the corticosteroids, of course, can cool inflammation and potentially slow down that process. On the other hand, we know that corticosteroids have a catabolic effect in and of themselves on, regarding tissue, their effect on tissues. So what would be the balance of these two you know, driving effects? Is it gonna cool inflammation, slow disease prog 
process, progress, or is it going to actually injure the tissue um, and cause more harm than good? And it really has been uncertain up until more recent uh, days here when we now have MRI technology that's able to really examine cartilage very minutely and give us information about the cartilage itself. Um, so that's what these authors were looking at. And hopefully they also looked at pain and function, which is what me and my patients care about as well. Okay, so their question again, what is the effect of intraarticular corticosteroids on cartilage, pain and function in patients who have symptomatic knee osteoarthritis? Uh, this was a double blind randomized controlled trial. The population included 140 adults who had knee osteoarthritis. It had to be symptomatic and painful. It had to be documented on x-rays as being grade two or three in severity. They had to have synovitis, so on uh, both physical exam and by ultrasound, they had to have findings of inflammation because they really wanted to capture a group of patients who were inflamed and might therefore benefit from corticosteroid. The intervention arm received 40 milligrams of triamcinolone injected into their knee every three months on the dot to the T um, for two years. And the control arm received saline on the same schedule. Um, so their primary outcomes were twofold. One is they were looking at the effects on cartilage. They used an MRI uh, to do this, getting it at baseline at the halfway point and at the two year mark end of the trial. They were looking at total cartilage thickness as well as a cartilage damage index, which had been previously validated. They also looked at pain and function. And the way they assessed this was at the time when they brought the patients back in for the, every three month visits, um, before they uh, injected them again, they did an exam and a history. They had them fill out a pain questionnaire, the Womack pain questionnaire. They also did a couple of um, objective uh, functional tests, including a 20 meter walk test and a chair stand test that were timed. So that was what they did to um, observe the effects of steroid. I'll also mention the patients were allowed to take whatever analgesics they were already taking for their knee pain throughout the trial, with the exception of within two days of each exam, they had to stop their insets just to avoid any masking of um, anti-inflammatory effect. All right, what did they find? So first, let's talk about the outcomes regarding cartilage effects. So what I've shown here is cartilage thickness in millimeters and comparing the triamcinolone arm to the saline arm and, what, and here we're looking at the index compartment. And that was the compartment that at baseline was the most severely affected by osteoarthritis. And what you can see is that both groups, triamcinolone and saline groups, did lose cartilage thickness over the course of the trial. The people in the triamcinolone arm lost two tenths of a millimeter compared to one tenth of a millimeter in the saline arm. And this difference did meet statistical significance. But if you're like me, you're scratching your head a little bit saying, hmm, one tenth of a millimeter, that's a small number. I'm not exactly sure what the cl clinical relevance of that is. And the authors do point out that there is no sort of set clinically important minimal difference in cartilage loss to uh, comment on disease progression, but it's different by a little number. So let's move on to the pain and function outcome. So here is a series of figures. Um, on the x-axis is always time. On the y-axis here is pain. Here is stiffness, and here are their um, objective functional tests, the 20 meter walk test and the chair stand time. And what you can see even from hopefully the back of the room is that there's no difference. So the saline folks are in blue, the steroid groups are in orange. These lines really march quite close together. So the punchline here is that they did not find any difference in pain or function in the patients receiving steroid versus saline. Some of the criticisms of this trial is that this doesn't necessarily mimic real practice and that we don't bring patients in on the clock every three months to give them steroid injections. Um, and the authors said, well, you know, we were really wanting to see what would be the effect of hopefully cooling inflammation in the knee on a regular basis. That was the reason they designed it that way. And then secondly, other critics have argued, you know, you're not seeing a benefit because you're not checking soon enough. You should be checking their pain and function within a few days to weeks after the steroid injection. And I think that's fair, but I would also say, you know, you're doing a procedure that has risks and costs, and you could argue, you know, what's the minimally acceptable or worthwhile duration of benefit that you would hope to see? Um, and if it's not a few months, you know, is that, is that worthwhile for everybody? And I think the answer depends on the patient in front of you, probably. But I think the big take-homes from this trial is that 
intraarticular knee steroid injections may hasten loss of cartilage. That inflammation effect, anti-inflammation effect may not be enough to overcome the catabolic effect or even slow the disease process. And secondly, in aggregate, it's not improving pain or function for our patients. I'll, I will say that I myself, and I'm sure some of you here, have specific individual patients who do seem to derive a miraculous benefit from these injections. And I think those, for those people, it's still reasonable to offer this treatment to them. But in terms of sort of in aggregate, and if a patient doesn't have a great response, this is sort of compelling data that there's not a good reason to keep doing those injections. All right. So we're going to move on to a new topic, but the same patient, because in primary care, we value continuity. It's one of our greatest joys. All right. So this is Ms. Hurt. She's back. She's our 59-year-old patient who had the knee osteoarthritis coming for a follow-up visit six months later. At the last visit, we had elected to not inject her knee, but rather told her to use ibuprofen sparingly. And unfortunately, today she tells you and brings in her discharge summary that she was admitted to a hospital for an upper GI bleed thought related to NSAIDs. Uh, okay, darn it. Um, however, the clinical question today is that she's doing much better, she's stable, she's off the NSAIDs. She's still a little iron deficient though, and she says, you know, the truth is, doc, I can't tolerate that oral iron. It binds me up, I'm miserable on it. I can't take it, I'm not gonna take it. All right, what can, do we have any hope for her? All right. So this is one of my favorite articles over the last year because I think it's such a neat proof of concept article. This was published in Lancet Hematology, which I know comes to all of your doors every month. <laughs> um, the authors, Dr. Sofal and colleagues, went back to basic physiology here to give us some help with oral iron. So a couple things to, for background. One is that current guidelines recommend that we give patients oral iron in big doses multiple times a day to sort of overwhelm uh, the gut and the absorption mechanisms. But what we know is that only an eighth of that is actually absorbed and utilized, and the rest of it just hangs around in the gut and causes constipation, nausea, abdominal pain. What these authors were observing is that when you give someone an oral dose of iron, it causes upregulation of hepcidin. And remember, hepcidin is a molecule produced by the liver that's the central molecule for iron and metabolism control. Hepcidin, when it's around, blocks iron absorption, blocks the body's ability to use iron. This is the mechanism by which anemia of chronic inflammation occurs. So when you're inflamed, you have more hepcidin around, you can't use your iron. Same thing, when you give someone a dose of oral iron, you have an acute rise in hepcidin, you therefore block the ability for the body to use the next dose of iron that comes later that day or the next day. That was their hypothesis. So they wanted to design a study to see if this was really true. Their questions here was, does oral iron absorption get better if we give it every other day instead of daily? And is it better if we give it once a day than twice a day? They designed two open label randomized trials. They included healthy women. These were recruited from the University of Zurich in Switzerland um, who had iron deficiency and mild or no anemia. So just to let you know, the baseline or the mean hemoglobin in this group was 13 and the mean ferritin was also 13. Only four of the patients were actually anemic. They were otherwise relatively healthy. There were, as I mentioned, these two trials. The first one was the patients were randomized to get daily iron dose. It was ferrous sulfate, 60 milligrams a day for 14 days. And then the other group was randomized to get the same dose, ferrous sulfate, 60 milligrams every other day for 28 days. So their total iron exposure is the same. It's just one's getting it daily, one's every other day. They were using a special um, radio-labeled isotope of iron so that they could then measure the uptake of this isotope in blood cells uh, two weeks after administration to see how, it, how bioavailable it was. In the second trial, they're comparing once a day to multiple times a day dosing. They did a crossover design for this. So the first group got daily iron for three days, 14-day washout, and then twice daily for three days and vice versa in the other group. Okay, what did they find? So this is looking at the first trial comparing daily iron versus every other day iron. And what they're able to show, which was, this was their primary outcome of interest, is that both the fractional iron absorption and the total iron absorption was actually higher in the patients getting iron every other day. And this did, this was statistically significant and did correlate with increased hepcidin levels in the people getting the dose every day, which fits with their physiologic mechanism. The hemoglobin 
and ferritin of the two groups was about the same after the end of the trial, and I'm not surprised because this is a short trial with not a lot of iron. It was really more proof of concept. Regarding their second trial, which was comparing once a day to multiple times a day dosing, they were able to show there was no difference in how much iron was absorbed. So the patients effectively were not getting any benefit from that second dose of iron on any given day. Um, and they also had higher hepcidin levels in the multiple day, times a day um, dosing groups. So the take homes here, although this is a small study, patients were pretty healthy, it was short duration, um, is that they were able to show iron absorption being superior on the alternate day dosing and that giving it multiple times a day also was not beneficial. I think this is good news. I am awaiting a larger trial that has um, patients who may be a bit more ill studied for longer to make sure that it has the improvement in hemoglobin that we would expect. But full disclosure, I'm already using this with some of my patients who are very pleased to use less iron. All right, I'm developing some low back pain, Dr. Overland. All right, okay. on to the next patient. We are not yet running behind in clinic, but we will be after this one. So we have a, a lovely gentleman named Shaq. He's a 46-year-old man with nonspecific chronic low back pain. He's tried a variety of Icy Hot trademark uh, products with some benefit, but his activity level is starting to get limited by his pain. His former provider, Dr. Dre, had mentioned gabapentin, um, but he wasn't totally sure if if that would be something that would be good for him, given what he'd heard about the side effects. So what would you advise Shaq about gabapentin for his low back pain? So I want you to just sort of whisper to your neighbor. Um, yes, gabapentin, give it a try. Probably going to be helpful. Maybe benefits probably outweigh the risks. And the risks probably outweigh the benefit. Or no, there's no role for gabapentin in nonspecific low back pain. So I want you to like whisper. Maybe. Here's some maybe. All right, good. Buzz, buzz, buzz. All right, so let's talk about gabapentinoids and chronic low back pain. So um, as we all know, low back pain is extremely prevalent. 50 to 80 percent of adults will have it at some point in their life. Probably all primary care doctors will have it from sitting down in a chair and leaning forward and looking over a computer all day long. Um, and, but the, what we can do for low back pain is frustratingly limited. So acetaminophen doesn't really work. NSAIDs probably work, but as we know, they have pretty bad side effects. I'm getting more and more worried about the cardiovascular impacts of NSAIDs. I'm trying to be more sparing when I use them. Uh, we'll talk about opioids in a little bit, um, but what do we have? What, what safe interventions do we have? So this group of uh, folks in uh, 2017 looked at the benefit and safety of gabapentinoids in chronic low back pain. Oops, wrong button. There we go. So are gabapentinoids safe and are they effective in chronic nonspecific low back pain? So this is not looking at people with radiculitis or neuropathy. This is looking at those people with just an achy, breaky low back. It was a systematic review and meta-analysis of interest here, something I want to highlight. They looked at almost 1,400 studies and included 14 for their total analysis. So the quality of evidence here is, is extremely poor, um, but we ended up with uh, basically eight randomized <coughs> control trials that we're gonna be talking about here. Um, they had to be 18, had to have low back pain for more than three months, and they received uh, gabapentin or pregabalin or a comparator. So three of the trials were gabapentin versus placebo, two of them were gabapentin, pregabalin, crossover, and three of them were pregabalin uh, versus a comparator. So two of the outcomes here, the top one being pain relief as mean differences with gabapentin compared to placebo, and the bottom being pain relief versus, as mean differences with pregabalin alone versus active analgesic control. Um, and on the top one to the left would be better, would be favoring gabapentin. As you can see, it crosses null, so it's um, not statistically significantly better to take gabapentin. On the right to the left would favor pregabalin. As you can see, it clearly favors the active comparators. So gabapentin is not statistically superior to placebo. Maybe a trend towards benefit, but also a, a lot more side effects. Um, and pregabalin is inferior to comparators. The comparators being used in these, in these studies were tramadol in one and then amitriptyline and acetaminophen, or sorry, tramadol and acetaminophen and then amitriptyline in the trial. So uh, pregabalin was worse than the others. 
So should you offer Shaq a trial of gabapentin for his achy breaky back? The answer is no, probably not gonna help Shaq for gabapentin. You're gonna cause side effects and probably not gonna get him any benefit. So Shaq gets frustrated. <laughs> sad Shaq, nobody wants to see a sad Shaq. Um, and you're frustrated, so what do you have to offer him? Um, I was delighted that this trial just got published uh, last month, but the uh, doctor who uh, did the study actually presented these findings at SGIM's national conference last year. It was very exciting for all of us in the room. And it was looking at opioid versus non-opioid medications on pain-related function in patients with chronic back pain or hip or knee osteoarthritis pain. So the space randomized control trial. So the question here is, do opioids lead to better pain-related function and decreased pain intensity in patients with chronic low back pain or knee or hip osteoarthritis? And their hypothesis was yes. Opioids are gonna to lead to better pain management, less pain intensity, but increased side effects. Um, so it was a pragmatic 12-month randomized control trial that was 265 veteran patients, uh, the Minneapolis VA and a bunch of community-based outpatient clinics that surround Minneapolis. <laughs> And they had a treat-to-target strategy with either opioids or non-opioid analgesics, and the outcomes were pain-related function, pain intensity, and medication-related adverse effects. And I really like this trial because they included basically everybody. I mean, you, could, you couldn't have an active substance use disorder, and if you were already on long-term opioid therapy, you were excluded, but everybody else, people with severe PTSD and major depressive disorder and various other things that, that really represent the patients that I see every day, so it wasn't sort of selecting a healthy population. It was all comers. They had pharmacists helping with their disease, with their medication protocols and each, um, each arm had a three-step protocol. So step one for the opioid group was short-acting opioids like oxycodone and Vicodin and, and immediate release morphine. Step two was long-acting opioids and step three was a fentanyl patch. Um, and then in the non-opioid arm, the first step was NSAIDs and acetaminophen. The second step was um, some antidepressants and topical therapies. Uh, duloxetine, and the third step was uh, pregabalin, but of interest, the th they also included tramadol in phase three of the non-opioid group. Outcomes, um, as, as you can see, the three outcomes that I wanted to, to highlight, pain-related function, pain intensity, and medication-related symptoms, so lower is better in all of these. And the opioid group uh, and the nopioid group, uh, everybody benefited. There was no difference in how much they benefited. Um, in the pain intensity, the opioid group and the nopioid group, everybody got better, but the nopioid group got more better, more better. And then in the medication-related symptoms, um, lower would be better, and the nopioid group did much better than the opioid group. <clears throat> of interest, if you dig down a little bit better in a post hoc analysis, that pain intensity benefit is almost entirely derived from the knee osteoarthritis and hip osteoarthritis group. If you break out the back pain people from the knee and hip pain people, uh, the back pain people didn't actually um, have a difference in benefit between opioids and non-opioids. So I think this helps us maybe better frame the idea that, that starting someone on chronic opioids for a non-specific low back pain is not going to get them better, more better, or better, I'm gonna keep saying that, than uh, putting them on alternate therapies. So, no gabapentin for Shaq, no Vicodin for Shaq, what's next? Duloxetine, I love duloxetine. Um, so a group of people about eight years ago showed that duloxetine actually does help people with nonspecific low back pain. Um, and then they decided to do another randomized trial here to see who actually benefits from duloxetine for nonspecific low back pain. So this is post hoc responder analysis, so it gets a little bit stats weirdy in here. Um, of randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trials. Um, oops, excuse me. So they had about 1,600 patients, and they had a, a bunch of different outcomes, but they were looking at um, people who get a 30% reduction in pain, people who get a 30 to 50% reduction in pain, um, and who, who are those people. So in the duloxetine group here, about 60% of the patients got a 30% reduction in pain, uh, and about 50% got a 30 to 50% reduction in pain. Of interest here though, the um, placebo group, like 35% of the group got a 30% reduction in pain, and um, something like 30% got a 30 to 50% reduction in pain. So the placebo effect is really, really powerful um, in pain control trials, something to keep in mind. But duloxetine did have a pretty significantly statistically, a major statistically significant benefit over placebo. 
Um, but the duloxetine group did also have a 15% discontinuation rate versus 5% discontinuation rate in the placebo group. So uh, GI distress and dry mouth are the main um, side effects, and about 15% of people are going to stop duloxetine when you start it on them. Um, and the people who benefited from duloxetine uh, tended to be women, um, people with two or more pain sites, and people who benefit within the first two weeks. So if you see a 15% reduction in pain um, in the first two weeks, you're more likely to have a you know, 30 to 50% reduction in pain by 12 weeks. Um, so I think duloxetine is certainly a reasonable thing to try in patients with nonspecific low back pain, keeping in mind that the GI side effects are intolerable for some. Um, and maybe if they have more than one pain site, um, and if, they, if they're sort of early responders, they're probably more likely to see benefit ultimately. And then low back pain. So how about the physical therapies and the yogas and the things like this? So this group did a non-inferiority trial of yoga versus physical therapy versus education, sort of usual care. Um, they looked at uh, people at an academic medical center and a bunch of federally qualified health centers, um, and they were randomized to either yoga, which was once a week for seven, or, sorry, for 12 weeks, physical therapy once a week for 15 weeks, or a brochure that was like managing your own back pain kind of brochure. So that was 12 weeks, and then a 40-week follow-up trial where they were, they were encouraged to do a home yoga program or home physical therapy program. Unfortunately, uh, they did not, well, they did not find that foot yoga was inferior to physical therapy, but they found that neither of them were actually better than education itself. So yoga and physical therapy didn't do any better than handing someone a booklet and telling them good luck. However, <laughs> the, uh, the adherence to the trial was very low. So on average, people only went to seven sessions of yoga. Um, so seven sessions of yoga is not helpful. Um, the people who did actually start an actual yoga practice or did actually go to physical therapy and continue a home exercise practice did get better, but they didn't really design the, the study to look at those populations. Um, so this was sort of a negative trial in a way, but I think the take home would be that if you can get someone to start a yoga practice and continue a yoga practice, it's probably going to benefit them. But just telling your you know, busy patients to do yoga is not going to be an effective intervention for their low back pain. <laughs> so what are we going to do for shack? Um, I, we're not going to start gabapentins for shack because it's not helpful and it probably causes more adverse effects. We're not going to start opioids for shack because as we all, I think, know at this point, it's not going to help him. Duloxetine might actually help and make him feel a little less sad, too, about his back um, and demise of his broadcasting career. Uh, so titrate to 60 milligrams daily. Make sure you warn them about uh, adverse gastrointestinal side effects, have them take it with meals, um, and probably check in with them early to make sure that they're benefiting from it. If someone does benefit at 12 weeks, they're not going to benefit. And if they're not seeing a lot of benefit earlier, they're probably not going to have big, big responders. And then yoga as practiced by real people, not helpful, but yoga as practiced by motivated people who actually do it uh, is probably going to be helpful if done habitually. And then the next patient here. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bella. Oh, you don't need that. All right, we're gonna make up time in our schedule, right? Because we just have an acute visit. It's gonna be quick and easy. No problem, no more of this chronic low back pain. This is Miss URI. She's a 32-year-old healthy woman. Um, coming in for an urgent visit, she reports 10 days of upper respiratory infection symptoms, starting with a sore throat and nasal congestion, and now she's developed cough with the green sputum. She is quite convinced that she has a bacterial bronchitis and strongly feels she needs an, an, an antibiotic. And you, however, feel a viral etiology is more likely. Uh, the question is, is there an evidence-based objective test that might help? So I think this situation is a very familiar to many of us in the audience, and we have a lot of angst about what's the right thing to do in this scenario, and it would be great if we had a magic bullet test to uh, give us an objective answer that would satisfy our patients and ourselves. Okay, we're gonna talk about procalcitonin in acute respiratory infection, and just as a refresher um, for any of those who need it, so procalcitonin is a peptide that can be produced in all parenchymal tissues in response to a bacterial infection. And this is a cytokine-mediated process, so interferon, um, or sorry, interleukin-1-beta, TNF-alpha, and IL-6 cause um, 
hercalcitonin production in parenchymal tissues. This happens pretty acutely with a bacterial infection onset, and it resides very quickly once the infection is resolving. So there's a lot of interest in the use of this molecule um, to guide antibiotic use for infections. I'll also just say here that in the outpatient setting, inappropriate treatment of acute respiratory infection is the most common way we get into trouble with overprescribing antibiotics. So there's clearly a problem here with regard to antibiotic stewardship and the effect of inappropriate antibiotics on our patients um, and, side, and the related side effects of that. Okay. So let's talk about this um, review. This is a Cochrane review that was published in October of this year. The question here by the authors is, what is the safety and efficacy of using procalcitonin to guide antibiotic use in acute respiratory infections? They looked for trials that were randomized and included patients with both upper and lower respiratory infections. So this included everything from sinusitis, otitis media, tonsillitis, uh, um, asthma exacerbation, COPD exacerbation, pneumonia, including community-acquired, hospital-acquired, and ventilator-associated. So a really broad um, collection of infections. And the patients could be seen in a primary care setting, an emergency department setting, or in the hospital, including the ICU. Um, the, the, the trials had to have a randomization in which the patients were either on a procalcitonin-guided algorithm to guide antibiotic use or usual care. The primary outcomes of interest were death and also treatment failure at 30 days. And depending on which setting you were, the treatment, definition of treatment failure differed. And they also looked at antibiotic use and also antibiotic adverse effects. OK, so ultimately they ended up finding 26 randomized controlled trials that met their inclusion criteria, nearly 7,000 patients. Here I'm showing you their primary outcomes. So first of all, with regard to mortality, they find a 1.4% reduction in mortality in the procalcitonin guided care arm. And this did meet statistical significance. At the same time, there was no difference in treatment failure. So patients weren't doing worse if you use procalcitonin to guide their care. Of, of great importance, they showed a reduction in antibiotic exposure of 2.4 days in the procalcitonin arm. And they also showed a reduction in antibiotic associated adverse effects, which makes sense. Both of these met high statistical significance. All right, so I know what your question is, because it's what my question was too, which is that this is a primary care focused talk. How many of these trials were primary in the primary care setting? It was two. However, it was about 1,000 patients, so a reasonable chunk of patients. And when I looked at these primary care trials in specific, um, they were actually pretty compelling. So the first one was published actually back in 2008 in the Archives of Internal Medicine and included about 500 patients. And the inclusion criteria for the trial was that their provider thought they did need an antibiotic for their acute respiratory infection. So they were going to prescribe it. Then they got the procalcitonin test. If it met the threshold, they were then sort of encouraged to use an antibiotic. And if it didn't, they did not use an antibiotic. And so what they found was that using this algorithm resulted in a 71% reduction in antibiotic prescribing in these patients and no difference in their treatment outcomes at 30 days. So no worsening, no admissions, no ARI-related complications. So very compelling reduction in antibiotic use. The second trial was published in 2010 in a European journal, very similar design, about a little over 500 patients. Um, and they were able to show a 34% reduction in antibiotic use and no treatment, uh, no treatment difference. So this all seems fairly compelling. What's the catch? There's always a catch. Um, there are a couple, namely cost. So procalcitonin is available as a commercial assay on a couple of proprietary machines. It's very expensive to buy the machines, and the, the test itself uses um, expensive reagents. Um, I didn't mention it before, but I should mention that it does have a rapid turnaround. So in terms of timeliness, it's a one to two hour. So that's not a barrier, but it's very expensive. And another um, issue is that sort of who bears the cost of this and how does the cost benefit analysis roll out in healthcare systems? I think there's sort of greater goods here, including antibiotic stewardship and avoiding harm to our patients, which is very important. But it's also um, can be challenging in the real world to justify a very costly <coughs> test. Um, and you can also see that it may be used inappropriately. So if you use procalcitonin on every patient that you saw, that would not be high value care. 
because there are clearly patients who have a viral infection who this test you should not run, and there are clearly patients of bacterial infection that you should not. So this high value usage would really be limited to the patients that are at a gray zone. So all that being said, I mentioned this trial because I thought it was interesting. I thought it's an area that we could use um, something as a tiebreaker in these patients who we see all the time, something that's objective. Um, I'm not sure if this will soon or ever become prime time in primary care, but I think this evidence is really interesting and compelling and is something that perhaps we can hope for down the road. Um, so I just make a note, they had really compelling findings in this trial, but significant barriers do exist. All right. All right, on to our last patient of the day. I'm getting a little personal here, but I really wanted to include this study because it was my fate, most like sort of self-validating study of the year. So we're gonna have Mary Ann. She's a 41-year-old female physician. She's horrified to discover that her once healthy lifestyle has deteriorated after medical school and residency and the birth of a couple of kids. So beyond adding hours to the day or cloning herself, how can she improve her, her health and longevity? So there was three studies this year, but just in the interest of time, uh, in, only including one. One was about coffee, yay. One was about sleep, sleep is good. The other one was uh, the weekend warrior lifestyle. So looking at the weekend warrior lifestyle and the um, benefits for all-cause mortality, cardiovascular and cancer-related mortality. Um, so as you all know, the World Health Organization really recommends 150 minutes of moderate uh, intensity activity every week or 75 minutes of very strenuous activity a, a week to um, improve mortality and cardiovascular outcomes. We all know that cancer and, and cardiovascular disease are the one and two uh, biggest drivers of death in the world. Um, but you all also know that working a million hours a week and having a family makes it really hard to meet these targets. It's hard for our patients, it's hard for us. Um, so this study was really interesting to me. They wanted to look at uh, the associations of sort of what they call weekend warrior uh, lifestyle and risk for all cause cardiovascular and cancer mortality. So just by definition, a weekend warrior is somebody who meets those activity targets, but does it in one or two sessions a week. So goes for like a three hour bike ride on Saturday instead of doing 30 minutes a day. Um, the population they looked at was about 63, 64,000 Scottish and English folks over the age of 40. Um, they did household-based surveillance studies and looked at all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and cancer mortality. They asked people at baseline a bunch of questions um, about their disease, uh, sorry, their, their physical activity sort of in the months leading up to that moment. Um, and then followed them over time. The reason they included people over the age of 40 is because they wanted to limit as much as possible people who might have congenital or childhood diseases that would lead to cardiovascular or cancer-related mortality. Um, and they um, excluded any death that happened within two years of enrollment in the trial. What's the good news? The good news is it, it's good for you to exercise. Um, and it really doesn't matter all that much how you do it. Um, so looking at uh, inactive as the baseline, so people who literally get no activity in their life. Um, people who are insufficiently active, so people who do something but don't need the World Health Organization guidelines. People who are weekend warriors who get the World Health Organization guidelines in one or two sessions a week. Or people who are regularly active, so they're exercising three or more times a week and hitting that 150 minute mark. As you can see, everybody does better. The regularly active people do a little bit better, especially in all-cause mortality. But in terms of cardiovascular and cancer-related mortality, the differences aren't big enough for me to start waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> lifestyle take-homes, exercise if you can, when you can. It's good for you. So, uh, we have gone through a lot of different uh, cases today, uh, sort of like a, a day, half day in clinic. I'm excited to go to my clinic at 12.30 today and have a day like this. Um, but just to refresh your memories about what we hope you walk away here with, statins are highly subject to the nocebo effect, so we all need to be really careful about how we are counseling our patients uh, when we are prescribing statins. If you tell people you're one in five, you know, 20% chance you're going to have a muscle-related side effect, then they probably will um, but if you tell them that they're probably highly likely to tolerate this medication without difficulty, they probably will that as well. New hypertension guidelines, look into them. Think about how you want to change your practice and whether or not you want to use the ASCVD risk calculator to risk stratify your patients into different hypertensive cohorts. 
Um, intra-articular steroid injections for knee osteoarthritis, probably going to hasten cartilage loss and doesn't improve pain or function. So save yourself the time and worry in clinic and think about uh, other ways to help people with their knee pain. Alternate day oral iron dosing does increase absorption compared to daily dosing. So especially in people who are not, um, you know, we, again, the study did not look at people who are profoundly anemic or who are really ill. But in our healthy um, populations who are iron deficient, I'm already recommending every other day iron to people. Um, gabapentinoids are not effective in nonspecific low back pain. Opioids are not better than non-opioids. And of note, um, at the VA, we have now got re received the directive as of yesterday that everybody has to be less than 50 milliequivalents, uh, 50 morphine equivalents a day of opioids going forward. So I think it's nice to have a little bit more um, data in our pocket to help support some of those uh, policy decisions when we're educating our patients about why that's important. Um, duloxetine, worth a try, and yoga for somebody who's actually going to do it. So recommending yoga to someone who is really never going to do it is not going to help their back pain. But if someone thinks that they can actually do it, it's going to be helpful. Um, Procalcitonin guided antibiotic ther uh, therapy, I think, is a really exciting thing to, to, that might be on the horizon. And I'm hoping that um, healthcare systems will look at this as a, as a good investment for them. Um, and insufficient exercise and weekend warrior exercise is much better than being um, inactive in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all-cause mortality. So we have uh, our references here. You're all memorizing them. We included one study that um, we didn't get to, which was the new C. diff guidelines. Uh, long and short of it is just skip right over the metronidazole and go straight to vancomycin. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> And uh, we really wanted to thank the chief residents and Dr. Bremner for the invitation to come talk to you all. We're happy to answer some questions. I know we only have a few minutes, um, but thank you again.